Hey, Daniel, how are you? I'm good, Glenn. Thanks again for having me back. You're welcome. This is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. And I'm with Daniel Bessemer, who's uh, assistant professor at the Henry Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. And we are going to have a conversation. This is part two of uh, Daniel's interview with me about my intellectual origins. Part one posted at the Glenn Show two weeks ago. This is part two. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Daniel. He's going to interview me and we're going to have a conversation. Uh, but thanks so much, Daniel, for uh, being willing to play this role. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity again. So like, let's just get started. So last time I think we covered very well um, the appeal of economics and sort of the appeal of this epistemology, if you will, and in some sense an ontology to approaching the world. Uh, and we talked a little bit about politics, and you basically described yourself as like a standard boomer, black, liberal, kind of leading toward the left in the, in the 60s and the 1970s. But of course – things change. So I was wondering if maybe you could describe in a bit more detail your political evolution and particularly your shift from what might, uh, from what I, it sounded like, you know, vaguely social Democrats, center leftist to what would um, bec become the, the new American right in the 1970s and 1980s. Because I think this is a story um, that is, is, is paradigmatic in a sense, because you get a lot of people who are growing up in sort of the New Deal order of the 50s and the 60s and its decline in the 1970s, embrace what, what um, comes uh, to be termed neoliberalism. And I think, in fact, on several occasions, you have proudly stated that you are a neoliberal. So I would like just like to know what is what are the questions that are being asked by the New Deal order that you feel like aren't being answered by that same order? And what begins your shift from the center left to the right? Okay, that's big. That's a lot of stuff, Daniel. <laughs> uh, but I welcome the opportunity to reflect on it. And I'm not going to just be able to cover everything in one sustained <laughs> answer. I assume we're going to have a conversation here. I mean, I think you're right to say what my starting point was. I took my PhD at MIT in 1976, so let's use that as a baseline year. I started, I'm an assistant professor at Northwestern University. I'm a technical economist who's black and interested in social issues, but not particularly political. Uh, I am almost by momentum or inheritance a uh, black urban Democrat. I mean, that's what I am. I'm pro-great society. I'm pro-civil rights uh, revolution. I'm a moderate. I'm not a I'm not a bomb thrower, uh, and I'm an intellectual, and I'm a technical intellectual. I'm a theoretical economist, so, you know, I'm about my models and write, writing my papers, solving my problems. But I want to make the world a better place, just like my teachers, as I spoke of last time uh, we talked uh, uh, at MIT, uh, who were technical economists but were basically political liberals and who believed in the ability to intervene <laughs> They were definitely not laissez-faire. They, they saw themselves as opposed to the University of Chicago school of, you know, kind of spontaneous order, kind of. Everything is going to work itself out if you let the market uh, have its way. Uh, uh, they didn't think that, and I didn't think that either. But I don't know, 10 years later, by the time you get to the mid-1980s, I'm a Reaganite. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm basically... Um, uh, voting for Ronald Reagan in 1984. I can remember being with uh, William Crystal, Bill Crystal, uh, editor of the former uh, magazine, The Weekly Standard, and, you know, a never Trump intellectual and whatnot. I don't know exactly what he's up to just now, but I can remember being at a party at Bill Crystal's house in November of 1984, when the election returns are coming in and Reagan is burying Walter Mondale in a national landslide. I think Mondale only carried, uh, maybe it was Minnesota and Massachusetts or something like that. I mean, it was a, it was a horrible wipeout. Reagan was affirmed. Morning in America. And my wife at that time, the late Linda Lowry, a fine economist in her own right, who passed away almost 10 years ago, uh, and I were at this party, she was seething, seething. And I was like, right on, right on, you know. <laughs> How did that happen? I guess that's one of the questions that you're asking me. And I, I hinted at this a little bit last time that the supply-siders 
And there's this intellectual critique that was coming in from the right uh, of, uh, 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 you know, uh, big government and whatnot. And this, I guess, would have been a part of the General Reagan uh, era. Uh, it, it appealed to me. But you're right also to say that my neoliberal commitments were formed earlier. They were formed in the late 60s and early 70s as I was coming in to my consciousness as an economist and uh, basically believing in, you know, uh, much of the uh, benefit from uh, trade and, and markets, you know, letting prices have the way and so on. Um, but yeah, I became a Reaganite. Now, how did that happen? I don't know. I wasn't especially religious, but I resonated to the cultural critique of uh kind of uh, postmodern, kind of uh, uh, post-60s uh, um, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll revolution. I mean, I, there was something in me that resonated to that. Um, I was, I, 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 I actually didn't think that uh, the Sandinistas were the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, I, I was um uh, very unpersuaded by the the radical uh, left embrace of you know this was the Cold War by uh, the the what I thought was trendy and self indulgent kind of playing footsie with uh, uh, ideas that I thought were were, were profoundly wrong headed. I mean the Khmer Rouge were a recent memory uh, in uh, these years. Uh, the the Cultural Revolution was ongoing uh, in uh, China. Uh, the uh, you know, um, so I, I I thought America with a K made absolutely no sense whatsoever. I, I mean, I, I thought it was like I say uh, a kind of adolescent, sophomoric, uh, whimsical, uh, you know. Uh, lacked the uh, courage of the convictions necessary to sustain the foundation of your own civilization indulgence. Uh, that certainly had to be part of it for me. Um, the cities, the urban crisis, the, um, the neoconservatives, the, you know, uh, I was a liberal, but I was mugged by reality. What do you do about crime? What do you do about homelessness? Um, what do you do about, uh, about disorder? Um, you know, welfare, uh, these kind of uh, these kind of debates. Uh, I was at the Kennedy School in the uh, early part of the '80s uh, uh, around uh, uh, these debates on the constant basis. I remember uh, meeting and becoming friendly with Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, former senator, former uh, United Nations ambassador. Uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who uh, was uh, uh, he had a book called Family and Nation? This is 1985, if I'm not mistaken. He gave the Gotkin lectures at Harvard and turned it into a book. Um, and uh, we were debating in a friendly way. Charles Murray losing ground. I'm, I'm rambling. I'm sorry. You should you should uh, edit me. <laughs> so one question. These these things were in the air. I remember reading Gertrude Himmelfarb's book. You're an intellectual historian. The idea of poverty. This is. Uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb, the uh, uh, towering figure, I think, in intellectual, European intellectual history. Uh, this book about the idea of poverty born in um, England in the Victorian uh, and, uh, age. And uh, anyway, anyway, I was very much influenced by a lot of this ferment that was going on on the right in cultural and global political, as well as domestic policy and economic theoretic terms. Um, and, and I found myself uh, being, uh, being drawn into it. And this is not even to mention the racial uh, uh, angle, uh, which, which was also important. So one thing that um, is really interesting, when you go back and read about this period, it, it's really a moment of um, sort of like a Gramscian quote, quote right? The, the old is dying and the new is not getting ready to be born in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And people oftentimes actually describe it as feeling similar to what it feels like today, sort of this transitional liminal moment. So one thing that I'm curious that I want to ask you about specifically, it seems like there's... Uh, uh, two big shifts. Um, a lot of the books you just mentioned, and I know since I've read them, they're very, there's a strong emphasis on culture, 
right? And the creation of culture as sort of this, the, the structuring condition of reality, which is a big shift from the more Marxist orientation um, of sort of like the means of production or economics itself or structures of economic shaping society. So one question I have, this is the first of two, and the, but they're related, is one question I have is what appeal to you about the cultural explanation as opposed to the structural explanation? Why the primacy of culture? You know, it's actually a return to Hegel instead of Marx, right? You're returning to the idea as more important than sort of the material. I want to know why an economist makes that move um, first. And then second, another big shift, you know, and you see it, see it with the famous Thatcher quote, there's no such thing as a society, is from viewing sort of social groups as the node of decision making to viewing individuals itself as a node of decision making. So the real move, if you're contextualizing it in the context of the 1960s and 70s, is the move from sort of a cybernetic approach where you're viewing things as systems, as represented in like the trilateral commission in its final gasp, to the individual. So I'm wondering, like, what is appealing at this particular moment for like a young, soon-to-be superstar economist to make that the shift to culture and the shift to the individual? So it's very well put, Daniel. Very thoughtful. I can see you've been uh, you've been thinking about these matters for a while. Um, and I don't want to get anachronistic here. I don't want to get ahead of myself or behind myself. If you're talking about the year 1983, it's different from the year 1993 for me, especially on the culture question, because I've become a born again Christian in the fullness of time. I am baptized at the age of 40 years old in 1989, 1989, and. Uh, Dorchester Temple, ba- Temple Baptist Church in uh, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm born again. I become a fervent Christian, practicing Christian. Really, I'm talking about getting up at six o'clock in the morning and going to prayer two or three times a week. Um, I, I'm talking about setting up the folding chairs in the high school gymnasium where the church is meeting to hold its Sunday services because it doesn't yet have a property. And coming in there with a crew and setting up those chairs Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I'm talking about standing in the back of the room when we're meeting in a nursing home to minister to the residents of the nursing home by having a service there. With my infant son sitting on my shoulders and we're back in the back, uh, you know, praising the Lord. That's Glenn Lowry circa 1989, 1990, 1991. Uh, And uh, that guy doesn't exist in 1983. But there were intellectual currents, of course, you say culture, structure. I think you put it too neatly, Daniel. I I think your your polarity or your dichotomy is too pat. But I see see what you mean. Marx has really got a different angle of vision than I don't know, uh, than does uh, Durkheim or Weber. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, and it's true it's true that uh, you take something, I mean, we could bring down a notch. We bring it down a notch from Marx and Durkheim and Weber down to Daniel Patrick Moynihan arguing with, what? who was it, William Ryan? Was he the blaming the victim guy uh, from the 1960s, the Moynihan Report? But, I mean, in a way, they're, they're kind of having the same kind of conversation about uh, the forces, the forces, you know, the material forces, the, the patterns of property ownership and the modernization and urbanization and conglomerates and, and, you know, a powerful interest, uh, the thing that determines what happens on the streets of an uh, inner city tenement somewhere where, you know, uh, people are or are not uh, adapting to the, uh, the realities of urban life. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I did become a neocon in a way. I mean, I, I, I can remember some of these people. Uh, James Q. Wilson, who was a young, relatively young political scientist, thinking about crime. That was a, a big collection of his essays, and I think that was like 1978, 1979, something like that. Uh, Nathan Glazer, a very sweet man, uh, one of the New York intellectuals uh, who uh, uh, wrote a book called Affirmative Discrimination, which was a kind of warning about some of the pitfalls of affirmative action, some of the deep questions that were being raised by affirmative action, which was in its infancy and very contentious in the late 1970s. Um, we were talking about Jews in my, in my uh, intellectual history from my education at MIT, but many of these uh, neoconservative intellectuals who were trying to come to grips, they had been Democrats, they have been, been Trotskyites, they have been, uh, you know, Marxists. 
uh, and and uh, this is the alcove culture at the City University of New York or whatnot. And and uh, they've been liberals, and and they've been uh, uh, New Dealers, and 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 uh, you know whatnot. But cities were falling apart, you know, the riots, the the you know the, the, the uprising and whatnot. Crime was going like this, uh, and the family, the conventional arrangements of social domesticity. Uh, we're undergoing a profound transformation, the, the pill and feminism. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to pretend to be an intellectual historian, and I, I should stop. <laughs> well, I, I, well, it's <laughs> interesting. You ask me why more of a relational and cultural than of a material and how that's an odd thing for an economist. And what I want to emphasize, I talked about my dissertation last time, is that my whole argument was built on a kind of priority of relations before transactions, a kind of situating the developmental economic process by which people come to have more or less effective capacity to generate earnings and wealth in their economic lives, that process to situate it in social relations in the context of family and community and uh, ethnic group and uh, network uh, connections among people. So that that uh, would naturally uh, predisposed me to be thinking about, you know, uh, what are the norms governing the aspirations and the disciplined behavior of people in a particular peer group who want to uh, achieve esteem vis-a-vis -vis their fellows in the context in which that collectivity of people come to articulate for themselves ideals about what constitutes a good life, a life well lived, an honorable what is a what is admirable? What is what behaviors are to be affirmed? What are to be rewarded socially? That's an organic, uh, 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 you know, phenomenon of social relations, and and it's an ideational phenomenon. It's 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 a it's a it's a um, it's not pinned down. It's not predetermined. I would argue uh, by uh, by structural forces. And I think there's a killer argument to this effect, which is. People want to celebrate protest, uprising, and revolution. Don't they see agency there? If the underdog can rise up and seize the reins of power and overthrow the oppression, that actor, the actor who can undertake that project, is a world maker. It's someone who envisions beyond the confines of their material condition and creates a world, namely the new world, the reform world, the post-revolutionary world. How are you going to preach revolution to me and at the same time uh, anchor your entire intellectual uh, outlook in a presupposition of material de uh, predetermination? Uh, predetermination? That, that seems like a contradiction in terms. If I really did believe that material forces determine everything, I'd be without hope for the possibility of political change. That's really interesting because not to deny the agency of people, but then where does policy fit into that? Because policy is trying not to, I guess you, you could be, so you could look at policy as trying to affect the structural level or policy as trying to affect the level of the family. Um, but wouldn't the, 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 the question be in how those two levels interact? And it seems like at the time you found most powerful focusing on the level of the family or focusing on the level of the individual within the society. And I also want to relate that to I mean, the revolutionary argument would, would be is that you're never going to be able to truly affect that individual level unless you totally transform society. So what was appealing, I, and I think this probably plays into the race question, about promoting a more, um, I, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense at all, but a more accommodationist perspective, is that you need to live within sort of the cultural confines or the cultural um, the, the, the cultural world of that being imposed upon you by the majority white society at the time. And, and I guess what I'm saying is how did the black politics play into this at the time, you know, from where you came and where you saw it transforming over the 1970s and 1980s to the point where in 84, you're a Reaganite. Oh, Daniel, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it's a, it's a very neat story here. Um, my alienation from the black cognoscenti, from the from the the, the black elite spokesperson, uh, sort of self conscious embodiment of black aspiration, the talentative. My alienation goes way way back. I mean, there's a class issue here. Um, 
I can remember a story my mother uh, told me because uh, she was one of four siblings and uh, their father abandoned them and the mother died young. And so they were children farmed out to relatives and my mother happened to be taken care of by uh, an aunt who was prosperous, owned property and had savings and could afford to give my mother piano lessons and things like this. But her brother got uh, taken in by an aunt who had much less, and he was poor. And his poverty showed in his clothing and whatnot. And he was always hungry when he came to the house and things like that. And uh, my mother, to her everlasting shame, she, she deeply regretted it and, and, and was so sorry for it, but remembered berating her brother for being poor, berating him for his dress. She was a higher class of Negro, quote unquote, that was her own brother. Now, as I say, in retrospect, she was a child. In retrospect, she came to feel very badly about that, but it, it, it bespoke something about this kind of status kind of thing. And I was always very conscious of it. And because our family were somewhat vagabonds and dispossessed, taken in by my mother's sister, finally, when my mother, I'd been to five different elementary schools before I had completed the fifth grade. So it was a very unstable early life. Um, but, we, but I never thought of myself as a part of the aristocracy, as a part of the kind of elite, amongst African-Americans, amongst African-Americans. Um, I was used to a kind of social prejudice. Some of it was skin color prejudice. It, it was a real thing. Um, and, and so that created a kind of outsiderness uh, for me. When I started penetrating the East Coast elite uh, establishments, first as a graduate student at MIT, but then as an assistant professor and coming around as a professional and being, you know, and, and, and the people whom I were encountering, my colleagues, my black colleagues, were vastly disproportionately from this strata of uh, African American society, which I which I held uh, in in some uh, at some distance, which I had some some hard feelings about. Um, and I could tell many stories to this effect. But I'll just tell one. Can I tell the story? <laughs> I'm on a boat on Lake Geneva. The Econometric Society summer meetings has convened in Geneva, and we're now having the uh, ceremony at the end of the three days of meetings. I had, as a young assistant professor at Northwestern University, presented a paper. And it was a, if I can say so, very brilliant exploration of a problem which I won't even try to describe, but was pure theory. And uh, the audience had been really uh, taken by my presentation. And some of the dignitaries who were vice president of the Econometric Society, a local whatever, uh, called me over for a toast to congratulate me on my paper. So that's how successful the paper was. I was traveling with a friend uh, who was a colleague, African-American, whom I had known going all the way back to graduate school. And I had a camera. I wanted my presentation recorded so I could show it to my Uncle Mooney. Um, and this fellow, we were the only blacks at the conference, refused to do me the favor of taping my presentation for whatever the reasons were, but I presume they were that he did not want to be seen to be standing out doing this taping because it seemed too much like being a tourist at something or whatever, because no one else was actually filming their presentation. He wouldn't do it. And I ended up asking a stranger who did it for me. But to me, that um, uh, experience, just kind of, there was a class difference between us. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to say more because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but but very personal, very personal. I was not one of them. Uh, their presumption to speak for me wasn't it the least bit compelling. Uh, I didn't think most of my colleagues in graduate school knew a, a whit about what was going on in the inner city. <coughs> I didn't think they'd last for five minutes without an escort. Uh, on a street corner anywhere where the real action was taking place. Um, I thought they were effete. Uh, I, I, I thought of myself as blacker than they. <laughs> I, I, it's a shameful thing to admit, but it's true. I did. 
I thought myself more authentically black than the vast majority of them. So, so there was, this is quite apart from politics, or maybe it's a different kind of politics. It's certainly not welfare state politics or, or whatever, but, but, but that was, that was uh, the Congressional Black Caucus. I thought it was a joke. God, I know, I'm, I, again, I, I, I confess to uh, this thing. Uh, this is 1979, 1980, 1981, 1982. Um, I'm starting to get invited. I'm now an assistant professor, then a tenured associate professor, now a full professor at Harvard, and I'm still not yet 40 years old. And I'm starting to get invited to these meetings and whatnot, and I'm meeting the leaders you know, of these civil rights organizations and the staffs of these congressional committees. And, the, and I'm just profoundly unimpressed, by and large, with what it is that I'm finding. And I'm listening to the speeches that are being given. I'm at the University of Michigan in the late 70s and early 80s. John Conyers is a congressman from Detroit. He's holding hearings because he's a member of the Judiciary Committee on Police Brutality. And the level of crime and violence in his own districts is astronomical. The Detroit Police Department is deploying helicopters in the morning to surveil the pathways that little girls are taking on their way to school because there's an epidemic of rape that has broken out in the district. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know, uh, that this is cartoonish. That this is going through the, this is already, I'm thinking this, and it's the 19, early 1980s. I'm thinking this is just going through the motions. This is living off of uh, vapors, off of ember, off of a, you know, the, the kind of Martin Luther King Jr. kind of aura. Uh, they're, they're trading on, there was a real civil rights movement. In 1983, this stuff is not a civil rights movement that, that I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm thinking, I'm thinking. It's not, it's not really about civil rights. Um, I, I, I'm uh, becoming a black conservative in my, uh, in my inclination and orientation. It's a lot of different things are going on at the same time. Uh, the Reagan thing, the economic thing, the uh, Cold War thing, the culture thing, uh, the racial identity thing. Uh, and I think my story is probably very unique to myself. One question I have, I actually have two questions. It's interesting that you mentioned Khmer Rouge because one of the reasons they rose was, of course, American bombing of Cambodia. So I was wondering how, like, I know there's this image of the Soviet Union as totalitarian that's very, very popular, particularly after detente kind of crumbles in the late 1970s. Um, I'd like to hear a bit more about that, but I think more importantly is that there's a, a connection that I hear you drawing between your feelings of authentic black, like you're more authentically black, and that inevitably engenders a contrarianism, um, particularly when you see these people who are representing your group who you feel like are, are not even a part of your group in some sense. And I was wondering if, is, if there's a way to um, articulate, it might be difficult, but to articulate a connection, but that feeling of being more authentically black and your embrace of a conservative politics, was it the idea that sort of the, uh, the, the plans, the hopes of the 50s and the 60s failed to, to come to fruition, to be realized in reality, and that you're going to try something new? Or is it mostly steeped in a contrarianism? Or is it both? And then um, let I ask that, and then I have a few more questions. So I want to basically linking black authenticity to the conservative politics. And then I'm curious, just as someone who studies this, I'm, I've read everything Francis Fukuyama wrote in the 70s and the 80s, so I'm like really in this mindset right now. You, what is your like feeling of the, of the U.S. empire at this, at this time? God, you're all over the place. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You asked me about the Khmer Rouge and whatnot, and I don't really know a whole lot about the history of the conflict in Southeast Asia, you know, not the way a real historian would know people that you... Uh, at a school of international studies must come into contact with on a daily basis. Uh, I'm sure there's blood enough on the hands of the U.S. Uh, in respect to how the conduct was uh, conducted. And I wouldn't be at all surprised that the convincing argument could be that the one of the knock-on effects of the <coughs> disturbance to political dynamic in Cambodia uh, associated with the U.S., uh, involvement in Vietnam was the uh, rise and uh, terror of the of the Khmer Rouge. Although <laughs> I would hardly hold the U.S. responsible for what it is that the Khmer Rouge carried out in the name of an ideology as far from what the founding fathers in the 1776 might have envisioned as you could possibly be. I mean, I, I, I you know, what did I think about the Cold War? Well, I, I thought, and I was reading Solzhenitsyn and 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 people like that. I was reading some of these Eastern Europeans. <coughs> 
because it was interesting. It was just an interesting time. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I thought even then that the jury was in. I mean, I watched what happened with collectivism and whatnot in the developing countries in Africa. They were a catastrophe. They were a disaster. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I knew who Gene Kirkpatrick was. You know, you're at the Henry Jackson School of International Studies. I remember what a, Jackson, a Scoop Jackson Democrat was. I know what that is. You know, I, I, I knew these people um, who were fretting about, uh, you know, the, the big uh, picture of conflict with, uh, with communism and were, uh, you know, very friendly to, much friendlier to Ronald Reagan. I, I think Gene, Gene Kirkpatrick went to work for him, actually, uh, uh, and uh, to standing off the evil, evil empire. Wasn't this one of the big issues that uh, people like, like uh, Norman Podhoretz and what not broke with the rest of the didn't Pat Ortiz have a book why we were in Vietnam or something like that where he an apologia about uh, about Vietnam so I I was aware of all of these uh, things going on as I say one of my good uh, friends and a mentor of mine at the Kennedy School an economist was Thomas Schelling uh, mm-hmm. a Nobel laureate and and a, and a the late great Thomas Schelling uh, a wonderful human being. Certainly no warmonger by any means whatsoever, but the whole point of the strategy of conflict is about deterrence. The, the whole point of the doomsday machine, this, you know, uh, Orwellian or uh, whatever, you know, this idea, you know, uh, I commit myself, my missiles will launch by automated mechanism. I have no control over it whatsoever. If you attack me, you destroy the world. This kind of idea. These were the kinds of ideas that were, being uh, floated around. It really mattered how you reacted to the deployment of intermediate range nuclear missiles by the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. It mattered uh, whether or not you believe that strategic arms limitation really did stabilize the under, well, I think the Cuban Missile Crisis was studied. It was still being studied when I was a professor at the Kennedy School in the 1980s as a classic case study in the execution of a kind of decision-making in crisis circumstance with the highest of possible stakes um, and all of that. So uh, maybe how you'll read this, Daniel, is that I was so deeply enmeshed in the machine, the machine of military, industrial, intellectual production of American hegemonic uh, global reach, that I had no perspective to be able to look at it in any way other than to see Jane Kirkpatrick as a perfectly reasonable person uh, arguing, uh, arguing the good fight. No, I, I think I bought the general neoconservative concern that, you know, the barbarians are at the gates in uh, terms of foreign policy, and, and this is, uh, uh, this is uh, communist ideology and whatnot, and there's a global struggle and that the barbarians are at the gates, quote unquote, with respect to domestic policy, which is to say that the post-World War II urban crisis is not going to be fixed with a transfer program. It's going to require some real restructuring. Of course, policy has to play a role. You asked about policy. It goes without saying that policy has to play. What is education if it's not a policy and be also shaping the way that people think about things? And I'm not just talking about cognitive education and reading and writing. I'm talking about civic education and moral education, what you know, you're shaping the citizen in some uh, very profound way. That's a that's a that's an act of agency and one for which people have to be held responsible. It's very interesting to hear because obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. But as a historian, I, I try to explain to myself why after Vietnam during the middle of like Central America, U.S. promotion of Central American genocide, like the U.S. is held up as sort of this paragon of morality vis-a-vis the Soviet Union. It's an interesting historical question, particularly in very, very elite institutions. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what I was just trying to get at very, very Why briefly. Why is the answer to that question that what, not, what notwithstanding its departures and its grotesque uh, distortions, those uh, principles behind the U.S., that were being reflected in, in U.S. projection of power 
in comparison to the principles and, and, and worldview and, and, and theory of politics and of the person that animated the Soviet project. That as between those two, we're talking about the future of the world here, uh, one would have wanted the uh, relative commitment to personal liberty, limited government, and uh, free economic uh, exchange to prevail. Well, I, I know that's got to sound like a cartoon to a sophisticated intellectual historian, but tell me, tell me where I oversimplify. Uh, sure. I, I don't think the Soviet Union ever had world designs. I think the more and more we actually dig into the Soviet archives, what winds up happening is Americans are peculiar in their truly universalistic desire, which I think emerges from the type of the um, – seriously from the puritanical uh, Protestant origin of this country, which is the city upon a hill, which transformed from being a, a model to being, you know, fully projected via power. I think the more and more we learn the Soviet Union didn't have genuinely global designs. Uh, I just like, I don't think China had genuinely global designs. I think that's a peculiar American pathology to think that they could actually make the world in its image related to our Protestant millenarianism, which um, suffuses the entirety of the culture. Even though I, I do agree, I like liberal, I, I like liberal, liberal freedoms. I think that's really important. So I, I what's well, important, uh, sorry, yes. No, no, I was just going to elaborate on the question a little bit. I mean, if I look at uh, Latin America, Central America, South America, uh, the Caribbean, I think about Cuba, um, if I, Venezuela and whatnot, but, uh, you know, Brazil. I mean, would we be in a better world and would those people be in a better place? Were the uh, political uh, uh, project of which, let's say, the Sandinistas or Fidel Castro were uh, exemplar to to have uh, more broadly prevailed. Or again, I offer the possibility that mine is a very oversimplified view of the world. But I'm trying to imagine what it would look like with a a, a little Venezuela uh, running amok uh, all throughout uh, that region, and it, it looks to me like hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people, would be worse off for it. Uh, well, I, I would say if you look at the history of sort of Latin America, the U.S., it's not even comparable with regards to what the U.S. or Cuba or the Soviet Union has done. I mean, the U.S. has intervened in the region for 180 years, has done things like invade Mexico several times. Most people don't even know about that. Um, has done dollar diplomacy, taking control of the customs houses of all of these various institutions, has chosen elite winners, has, uh, has funded death squads. So um, I think if you're comparing, I mean, one is like so, a, a, a state that has profoundly shaped the region. Another is a state that gave money to Cuba for uh, several decades uh, because the United States pushed Cuba into its arms, frankly, between 1959 and 1961. Um, so I, th I just don't think it was ever like we could look back on it now. I just don't think it was ever a real, the Soviet Union just wasn't a real threat. It was a weak country. It was a poor, it was a poor coming apart country. And we in the United States to justify what I think um, a particular vision of the global good did was I think actually gin up a cold war that the Soviet Union, including Stalin, never really wanted to fight. Um, but that's also the perspective of today. I think when you're coming out of World War II, you're coming out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, you're seeing the Soviet Union do things in Angola, fund Cuba. I could see why people uh, believed it at the time. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a particular perspective. But I, sorry, I didn't mean to get derailed. But no, I know no, that's you okay. I just want to ask one more question about this very briefly, and because and I'm, learning, I'm learning from you. So you say as a nation state, the Soviet Union, uh, much inflated as uh, in this uh, two-sided conflict, which you say is much more of a one-sided thing. And I, okay, I, I respect that and I take that. Now, uh, what about the ideas? What about, uh, was there ever a struggle of ideas in the third world, quote unquote, the developing world, the newly independent decolonizing states? Did it matter who was more or less influential on the ground in these places or, or was that, too, really a one-sided phenomenon of American messianic uh, global domination, uh, in, uh, you know, manifest destiny to on steroids kind of uh, uh, thing? Uh, you know, because it, it, I'm, I'm just going to lay my cards on the table. It seems to me it did matter greatly whether or not you uh, collectivized agriculture or uh, you, you know, had a much more mixed economy 
kind of understanding of how you were going to carry out your developmental program. And I, I somehow think that people were led astray by the model of planning and 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 uh, uh, central control and regulation that uh, stifled uh, economic development in a lot of places. But. I think the more we learn and the more we get into the actual archives of these countries, they just manipulated the superpowers to get money. I think these models, um, I, I think the, 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 the models were less imposed from above and adapted to local circumstances by local elites, except when, you know, the United States literally controls South Vietnam or the Soviet Union literally controls Eastern Europe. When we're talking about Egypt, when we're talking about other countries uh, throughout the, what we call today the global south, no longer the third world, when we're talking about India, these are local issues that are based that the superpowers are being used. I think um, a great book on, on India is this book called uh, The Price of Aid by the intellectual historian David Angerman. And he goes into the archives and you just see local elites essentially manipulating the superpower. So my problem with these sorts of projects is you wind up having the United States or the Soviet Union. They're both bad. Don't get me wrong. They're both bad. They wind up picking which corrupt local elite to give money to, thereby distorting organic developments on the ground. And whether, uh, in some circumstances, I think it didn't matter, but I think if you're looking at like the Cold War and the Global South as a whole, these are mostly local decisions being made by local actors and the superpowers wound up like funneling money, an extraordinary um, amount of money to one side, thereby screwing up the society in and of itself. So I think it, it just totally a failed, um, a failed project because you can't really impose, I think what the Cold War showed, you can't really impose these models in a real way, except in a super weak country that your, the, your government is literally funding and responsible for, like South Vietnam, the most extreme example, in some cases, Taiwan. Okay, I guess I'm going to have to stop my flag waving and my, maybe even take the flag down. <laughs> I might have to take the flag down. No, I'm, seriously, very interesting, Daniel. I'm going to I'm going to be thinking about that. But uh, let me turn the microphone back over to you as the interviewer. Sure, sure. So, um, why don't we get to? So, when do you start emerging into the public sphere? When when uh, do you, do you start saying, I really, I don't want to just be a technical economist. I don't just want to be a professor. I want to start speaking to, you know, large, large problems. When and why does that happen? That happens in the mid 1980s. And um, it, it happens mainly because I moved to the Kennedy School of Government from the economics department at Harvard. So uh, my career, uh, as of that point, I finished at MIT in 76. I was an assistant professor at Northwestern University Economics Department for three years an associate professor, uh, and uh, then full professor at the University of Michigan for three years. And then I went to Harvard in 1982. So I went to Harvard as joint appointment economics and Afro-American studies. They said Afro-American in those years. I was professor of economics and professor of Afro-American studies. So I was jointly appointed. <clears throat> and... It was an unhappy two years for me, and it's a it's a long story, and I will talk about this um, in in the uh, memoir about my um, choking really in economics at Harvard when I was a full professor jointly appointed and deciding to leave the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, which is the inner sanctum, this is, you know, you're now in the room with the other few hundred people who actually are the core faculty of this great university. I was a full professor in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and I resigned in order to take a professorship in the Kennedy School of Government. Every tub on its own bottom was Henry Rosowski's philosophy. The Kennedy School was an independent faculty over here, and indeed then had to negotiate terms on which I could serve on dissertation committees of graduate students in the economics department because I was no longer a card-carrying member of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and they guarded those prerogatives very preciously. We wouldn't want, you know, second-rate dissertations being written without, and yet having the imprimatur of economics at Harvard. I resigned economics, and I went over to the Kennedy School. And it's a long story that we, I don't have time for, and it wouldn't entirely be appropriate to digress into the, the psychological uh, explorations necessary to get all the way to the root and to the bottom of it. But um, uh, I'm saying now, in short, I choked. I, I, I feared failure uh, as a top flight theoretical economist and wanted to uh, 
I wanted a way out. I wanted a way out of what I, and, and <laughs> what I, Tom Schelling, the, the great Tom Schelling, I mentioned him, became my friend and, and, and mentor and office mate. We were right next door to each other on the faculty at the Kennedy School up there on the third floor. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I once confessed to him, I said, you know, I didn't know if I could, if I was good enough, I didn't know if I could write another paper that was going to make any difference if I was whatever. And I was terrified. And he started laughing when I told him this uh, in confidence. And I was just appalled that he would be laughing at me when I, I share such an intimate thought. And he, then he turns and he says, do you think you're the only one? <laughs> he says, this place is full of neurotics. Up and down the hallway, everyone living in fear of the dreaded question, what have you done for me lately? This was Tom. Uh, everybody was afraid of failing. My fear of failure wasn't any different than anybody else's fear of failure. You had to put your head down and get your work done. I'd be fine. I'd be fine. Uh, this was Tom. But I wasn't sure that I was going to be fine. So there was a, a push um, out of economics, which was this, uh, this sort of crisis moment where I didn't know if I was ever going to write another paper that would be worth a damn. Uh, and then uh, there was a there was a pull, which was that I had I had broken through um, my 1984 December 1984 piece in the New Republic, Martin Peretz. I remember having lunch with Marty. I'd been introduced to him by Abigail Thernstrom, the late Abigail Thernstrom, and uh, he lived in Cambridge, and he was uh, the publisher of the New Republic magazine, and uh, we we sat and we talked about my ideas for this paper, the new. A New American Dilemma was the name of this uh, title of this paper, and it was my manifesto. And it was my manifesto was there's an enemy without called white racism, but there's an enemy within called black social pathology. I actually used those words. And I said, we have to grapple with the enemy within. That's the New American Dilemma. <clears throat> it wasn't heavy on policy. It was more of a kind of 30,000 foot uh, survey of the thing, but it, it and it was, if I can say this, very well written. So now you remember, I'm a uh, epsilon delta limit as t goes to infinity, kind of the you know write down the equations and solve the model economist. But I was also uh, able to express myself elegantly in prose, and um, this uh, ended up uh, being a big hit for me. <laughs> I can still remember to this day. Daniel, going to the out-of-town newsstand in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is an iconic place. I don't know if it still stands. No one goes to newsstands anymore. This is one of your projects, right? No one goes to the yeah. archivist. Yeah. No one goes to these. Does it still exist? Do you know out-of-town out news? In any case, they would have all the magazines on the stacks lined up outside, and you could peruse, and you could read the town. You could pick them up. You could browse. And I loved going there, and I'd been going there for years, ever since I was a graduate student in the early 1970s. But this time, prominently on display, was a cover of the New Republic magazine with a lead uh, thing pointing to my piece in the New Republic. And I could see people reading it. I could see them standing around reading it. And I was now in the conversation. So other pieces in the New Republic came, and other pieces in commentary uh, came. I got to know Norman uh, Podhoritz. And Neil Kazadoy, uh, who was uh, the guy that I think was really running the magazine on the editorial side uh, uh, five days a week, uh, who was his uh, Pop Horace's right hand person at uh, at uh, commentary. I became buddies with these people, and I started publishing pieces in their magazine. And then I got to know the people at the public interest, and these were heavy hitters. This was uh, James Q. Wilson and uh, Nathan Glazer and Irving Crystal and Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Aaron Wildofsky uh, and, and a lot of other people of this sort. These were Daniel Bell was on the publication committee of the public interest in these years. <coughs> uh, many of these uh, uh, heavyweight political scientists, sociologists, historians, uh, policy analysts, uh, psychologists, um, uh, and uh, what question am I answering, Daniel? What got you interested in public policy? But I just want very quickly just want to point out again: you move from another world, uh, a world controlled isn't the right word, but like sort of permeated and in some sense dominated by Jews. Again, oh, so yeah. there's another 
it's another interesting sort of like like way way to move. And I have a couple of questions about that, but I will let you I will let you continue. Well, there were a few Catholics in this uh, new world that I went into. Austin, yeah, there weren't any Catholics that I know of on the faculty, not prominently, of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's economics department in the early 1970s. But while it was true that Jews were vastly overrepresented. It wasn't true that everybody was Jewish. <laughs> right. So I was wondering, as long as we're talking about this, because um, you've mentioned it, I know, in blogging heads, where at some point you felt like you were being used by some members of this community. So how did, what did it feel like to be a young black economist being sort of fostered as someone criticizing black America by a bunch of, of, of white people um, who are like sort of at the vanguard of this intellectual culture going back at this point two decades, 50s, 60s? Well, I mean, we're going back a ways now. Um, for me, this is the uh, mid-80s to the mid-90s when I'm in this uh, kind of coterie of uh, intellectuals and I'm becoming a uh, public person myself in a certain way. And it's a different time than it is today in the year 2020 when even hearing you utter that sentence, a black intellectual in this world of white people, makes me squirm because I don't want to be that guy. But but in 1985, I was that guy, and I didn't it, I didn't give it a second thought. And to a certain degree, there was a certain amount of carping going on from people, but it wasn't nearly as pointed. There was no social media. There was there was no cancel culture. It wasn't nearly as uh, pointed and and uh, you know vicious as I think uh, the environment today would be uh, for a person similarly situated. Um, I, and, and moreover, the, the issue of being used really doesn't arise for me in the 1980s. It, I don't really begin to become conscious of that dimension of the problem. Well, what's, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that everybody has some place to go at the end of the day when the music stops except me. I mean, some people are going to Dublin. Some people are going to Jerusalem. Some people are going to Rome. Everybody's got a people. Everybody can be Irish. They can be Irish. They can be Italian. Uh, they can be Jewish. Uh, but my black fealty, my fealty to black people as such, uh, was kind of disqualifying for me in that circle. I mean, I had to kind of surrender that on the altar. You know, I had to, I had to give up being black in, at, at a certain level. You know, uh, and uh, it this came to a head after some period of time. I mean, it took 15 years to come to a head. It came to a head in the mid late 1990s when I started breaking with people, when you know, especially my relationship with Abigail and Stephen Thernstrom, uh, because I, I wrote a very critical review of their book America in Black and White that was published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1997. And and I, I didn't speak to them again after that. And, and we've been very, very good friends. As I say, Abby introduced me to Martin Peretz and was indirectly responsible for me starting a career at the New Republic, where I ended up a uh, contributing editor and a, and a monthly columnist at the New Republic for some years. But in any case, um, I, I wasn't self-consciously the oddball out. I, I wasn't anybody's pet, that's for sure. I mean, I, I did feel that people were grateful for me and were respectful, not always uncritically so, and sometimes the criticism came from the left, <coughs> but um, uh, from the conservatives, sometimes the criticism came from them. I mean, and along the lines of what you said, have you not underestimated the importance of structural factors uh, in this account that you're giving? Don't you need to enrich this account? And, Aren't you perhaps getting a little preachy here? Aren't you perhaps getting a little bit up on a high horse here? You, you might want to have a bit of self-awareness about that, a, a temper it down, a little bit of irony. Um, but uh, uh, how did it feel? Tremendously empowering. Unbelievably exhilarating. Uh, I felt like I had a trump card in the... In the and this is all within my own mind, status game with my black compatriots from a different strata of African-American society who were much more liberal and much more having a feeling of entitlement and presumption to their, uh, to their uh, posture on behalf, speaking on behalf of black people and whatnot. And me being an outsider and a contrarian 
and also feeling myself to be coming up from below and a kind of an insurgent uh, whatnot. But I had, I felt like I had this trump card, which was that um, I was actually getting affirmed by some of the smartest people that I could find who were finding it interesting. I mean, Aaron Wildowski called me a national treasure in a comment that he made at one point in the late 1980s. Uh, the people that I was friendly with at Harvard, um, I got to know um, E.O. Wilson, the great uh, the sociobiology, uh, the great uh, scientist. Um, I got to know Robert Nozick, uh, the, the late great Robert Nozick, the uh, libertarian philosopher. James Q. Wilson became a friend. We actually edited a volume together uh, as a part of a collaborative project in the uh, in the 1980s. Um, and uh, the carping from my African-American compatriots about how I was getting too friendly with the uh, with the with the conservatives kind of just went over my head. I, I didn't really I didn't really care that much about it. I didn't think that much about it. So this might be a sensitive question and feel free not to answer it, but it seemed like you didn't think that the um, African-American community was, or, or that the community you were quote unquote supposed to be a part of was as intellectually um, sophisticated or as interesting. So what struck you? So as an intellectual historian, intellectual communities are so crucial to an individual's development and where they associate. So was there anything in particular that struck you about this group of sort of multicultural, basically ethnic whites. This is like when the ethnic whites begin to dominate the uh, academy in the 1970s and 1980s. I was, uh, is there something that about them that, that attracted to you or you just thought they were smart or was, is there anything more specific in addition to the personal feelings of affirmation that an, an, any young professor would feel these very, very smart people are commenting uh, that you're very good? Well, I don't want to leave it unrebutted uh, that I thought, uh, you know, the blacks who I was coming into contact with just weren't up to snuff. I mean, some weren't. Many, many were. I mean, I had uh, I have friendships to this day from that era of people that I met coming around Harvard, uh, people I deeply admire, like Orlando Patterson, the uh, sociologist, <clears throat> uh, uh, author of the book Slavery and Social Death, which was published first in 1982. It's a massively am ambitious uh, intellectual social history of slavery, going back to antiquity, uh, culminating in the Americas in uh, the 19th uh, century. But um, uh, and and others. I don't. I mean, there, there were many, many very able people. Nathan Huggins was chairman, a historian, died young in his early 60s, uh, but he was chairman of the Afro-American Studies Department when I came in. Uh, Martin Kilson, another member of the faculty at Harvard, not as productive as he ought to have been, God bless him, but always very brilliant and incisive, a student of African-American political history, political theory, uh, politics, culture. Um, I, you know, but... Um, the tenor of the of the the, the ferment, the the cutting edge uh, of the intellectual scene, especially in terms of discussing domestic uh, political and policy issues, the neoconservatives had an outsized influence on that conversation. They they were asking all I thought the right questions and were. Uh, now, Charles Murray is not a neoconservative, but I do remember his book Losing Ground. Okay, so this is the Great Society. So we had a war on poverty. Who won? Okay, I mean, that's basically the question. So there's only one acceptable answer to that question on the left. Of course, uh, we didn't spend enough. Of course, we didn't try hard enough. Of course, you know, whatever. But there were deep questions that were raised, and they, they played on in American politics for a quarter century. I mean, uh, we're still dealing with them to some degree. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, uh, J, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, welfare reform, I think that's 1996, so that's a decade on from the period that I'm talking about. But in retrospect, I think you have to say it was a furious fight amongst the Democrats. Uh, uh, Clinton came into a, a compromise with Newt Gingrich, and they passed this legislation, the Welfare Reform Act. Um, it was, A, a profound shift of the social policy of the United States of America with respect to the indigent. And, B, it was an intellectual victory in many respects for the neoconservative critique of the welfare state that uh, I associate with people like uh, Charles Murray, but also with others and with the public interest and 
and, and with others. They weren't wrong about everything. They were right. The neoconservatives, these are the smart people with whom I was happy to affiliate in the mid-1980s. Uh, not because they were all Jewish and we know Jews are smarter than other people. That wasn't it. <laughs> um, but because I thought that they were right and I think they have been proved uh, to be right about a lot of, about a lot of stuff. Uh, we could go into it, but they lost. I mean, they lost on some of these battles. I thought Abigail Thurston was right about voting rights. She had a book, Whose Votes Count? Uh, and this is, God, what year is this book? Uh, it's probably also like 1987, 1988. Um, and she basically says, do you want to go down this road of apportioning political representation weight based on uh, racial and ethnic identity in the country? I mean, at the base, it was about where do you draw the lines for congressional districts and do you create these majority minority districts so you can elect minorities? But it was a much deeper I mean, uh, she's not a philosopher, but it had a philosophically sophisticated predicate, and uh, she was also following the case law very closely. It's an important book. It should be read even, I think, uh, by by a specialist. Uh, even It begins an argument, an argument that I think still is worthy of engagement. Um, there were other things like that. I don't think James Q. Wilson was entirely wrong. I say that now, although <laughs> 15 years ago, I would have said he was dead wrong. But I don't think he was entirely wrong. I mean... The social control problem, it's a serious, it's a serious issue. And, and the role of, of uh, policing and prisons in the maintenance of civil order and the securing of liberty in practical terms on the ground in cities that are complex and difficult social mechanism, uh, mechanisms and organisms, you know, uh, the housing policy, uh, uh, skepticism along a lot of dimensions of the edifice that was the liberal public policy sensibility. Yeah, I, I thought that they were smart. I, I thought that they were interesting. Um, and I didn't, feel, I didn't feel that I was being taken advantage of because I was almost the only black in their midst. So how did this drift, let's say, to the center right inform your actual economic practice, your academic work? Um, did you see a shift in what you were studying? So we basically talked about your dissertation last time, and I know you could probably go on for a long time, but like, what is your actual academic work? How is that evolving over the course of the uh, 80s? Well, actually, I had stopped doing uh, academic work in the early, early mid-1980s and was much more becoming this kind of gadfly intellectual writing these pieces in the magazines. Uh, and I actually got tapped by uh, Bill Bennett, of all people, who was then Secretary of Education, to go in as his deputy, number two person in the Department of Education in the second term of the Reagan administration. But I had a personal scandal blow up in my face, an extramarital affair with a girlfriend, a fight that blew up. I got accused of assaulting her, which I did not do. The charges were later dropped. But at the time, it was a terribly discrediting uh, scandal. I had to withdraw from this public appointment. And in a way, I had to withdraw from public life. I had to withdraw from the aspiration to have a political career or a career in any kind of government administrative thing and uh, was kind of thrown back uh, to, well, where would I, what would I do now? Uh, and uh, it was a difficult period in my life. I found God. I, my marriage, thank God, was saved. We began a family. My wife, my late wife, Linda, and I <clears throat> two sons who are 30 and uh, 32 and 29 now. Uh, but uh, so in the quiet of this post-apocalyptic, apocalyptic for me, because it was a terribly traumatic uh, public humiliation, uh, and then the kind of rebuilding of my life, I left Harvard. Uh, and I moved to Boston University in 1991. Uh, John Silber was the president of the university there. He doubled my salary, literally, uh, which made it easy for me to walk across the river to Boston University. But I really was, again, running away uh, in the kind of uh, uh, shame and, and, and humiliation of my discrediting, uh, you know, behavior and then come up as... <coughs> <coughs> I stopped, in other words, I stopped doing economics for, I don't know, six, seven years. I had a little stuff that I was playing around with, a little theoretical problem-solving stuff, but it never amounted to very much. But after the fall, um, and after I pulled myself together, 
uh, we get to 1990, 1991, I've become a Christian. I'm a new father. I'm uh, back on track teaching at the Kennedy School, and I'm uh, deciding to move over, as I did in 91, to Boston University. I started writing papers again. And uh, some of the best papers of my uh, on my CV were written in those years. Uh, American Economic Review. I had three papers in the American Economic Review in 1993. Um, I wrote a paper that was published in the journal Rationality and Society, edited by the great uh, former, late great sociologist James Coleman, um, on uh, self-censorship and public discourse, which can be read to this day. I think it may be the best thing that I've ever done. There's not a single equation in it, Daniel. You'll be you'll be proud to know. I quote Leo Strauss. Uh, in that uh, in that paper, the, Aust- the Straussian, the father of Straussian. The Let me guess, book. esoteric and esoteric writing. Yes, um, that, uh, that's exactly it. Uh, what cool is essay. It uh, the uh, art of punishment and the uh, uh, art of writing. No, something in the art of writing. Yes, yes, yes. It's a. It's, it was written in the thirties. Politics and the art of writing, something like that. Like that, yeah. It's written at the New School when he was in exile. It's a really great piece. It's part of the natural right book, the natural right and law book that he, the collection of essays. Yeah, it's a great yeah. piece. Sorry, yeah. That's that's, uh, and, and I wrote other papers that were that were noteworthy, and I uh, started a center at the at Boston University called the Institute on Race and Social Division, which I ran for six years, and I got into the academic administration and fundraising ba- uh, game, and you know, running fellowships and hiring uh, adjuncts and supervising a staff and, you know, stuff. So I, I, I went back to more serious academic work in the early 1990s. You asked how did it affect my, uh, my work. Um, so I moved right ideologically and I started doing some consulting work. Uh, I consulted with the natural gas industry on price regulation at the federal level and produced a report arguing for deregulation and, you know, got paid very well to fly around to Houston and Atlanta and Washington and New York and uh, to meet with people and then to supervise a team that put out a a research report on natural gas pricing. Uh, I signed on with a big uh, national law firm to help them represent uh, a huge insurance company that was being sued for redlining uh, violations on the way in which they were handling their commercial uh, homeowners and automobile uh, insurance business in metropolitan areas and uh, build, you know, hundreds of hours of uh, consultancy work and helping litigators uh, develop and, and then present their uh, defense of, uh, of the big insurance company and in federal court, things like that. I started doing stuff like that. But that was not, that was always a sideline. I mean, it was just a way of, you know, supplementing my income. Uh, but it was something to which I would have not been perhaps attracted to do if I had been much more archly sort of uh, left or uh, in terms of my, of my, I didn't mind working for the capitalists. I didn't mind helping an insurance company uh, get paid, but that was never the, the major part of my, uh, of my work. Um, the, one of the papers that was in the American Economic Review in 1993, will affirmative action policies eliminate negative stereotypes? Okay. And we answered not necessarily in that paper. It's a formal model so it's a kind of technical exegesis. It's it's a theoretical, uh, but we're trying to identify the incentives and the countervailing incentives associated with stereotyping and with uh, affirmative action. We end up basically arguing that um, what you want to do is you want to encourage subsidizing rewards for acquiring skills, not subsidizing, not forcing employers to to uh, meet quotas. You don't want quotas. You want to work on the supply side, not on the demand side of the labor market if you're trying to enhance a disadvantaged group's position. This was a paper that had a little bit of a political edge to it, but um, it's, it's a very well-cited paper. It's become uh, very influential. You see it uh, excerpted, the Coate-Lowry model. It's joint with uh, Stephen Coate, an economist at uh, Cornell University. Um, <clears throat> you see it in textbooks and, and things like that. That was some of what came out of that work. I, I took the idea of social capital 
uh, which I had actually used, I coined that phrase in my dissertation, which I spoke of the last time we talked, the 1976 dissertation introduces the term social capital. I've been given credit for that by the likes of Robert Putnam, uh, James S. Coleman, and others as having been a progenitor of the concept of social capital, because as you'll recall from my previous conversation in that dissertation, I grounded much of my analysis on the observation that people got their skills in part as a consequence of the networks in which they were embedded and the skill acquisition of others within that network. So to have a position within the society that links you to many other highly skilled people is to be socially placed in an advantageous way from the point of view of your own uh, acquisition of valuable skill. That's to have social capital. Um, and I, I uh, used uh, the impetus from that uh, earlier work to spur uh, another paper that's been very widely cited on rotating savings and credit associations which I also wrote with Stephen Coden with Timothy Besley. Besley's an economist at the London School of Economics, <clears throat> Code at Cornell, um, which we called uh, rotating, uh, Economics of uh, Rotating Savings and Credit Associations, very, very influential paper. Um, so, and I got back to writing papers and, and uh, supervising graduate students and uh, uh, running, a, running an institute. Um, but as you move along the arc, you know, in terms of uh, your age and whatnot, the aspiration to make, you know, sort of fundamental sort of foundational sort of theoretical contribution versus to take on this kind of role of, uh, you know, more synthetic and, you know, sort of uh, great, great man, great woman kind of, you know, you're thinking about the bigger problems and you're not worried about dotting all the I's and crossing the T's. The relative emphasis of those two orientations shifts, I think, and mine shifted and has been shifting for some time more toward the latter. Glenn, I think that's a, a great place to end. I uh, unfortunately have another meeting in 10 minutes, but I'd love to do this again and get, get through the 90s and 2000s if, if, you'll, if you'll allow me. <laughs> I, I will allow you, but I'm not promising that I'm going to devote week after week after week of, because I alternate with John McWhorter here at the Glenn Show. Uh, and uh, <laughs> You have been the month of December, uh, <laughs> Daniel, and uh, very happy to have you. And yeah, let's do it again, but uh, we might want to uh, take a break. No, absolutely. Whenever you're ready, take a few months. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's super fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. I, uh, so I'm going to sign off here at the Glenn Show at blogheads.tv. Thanks for listening.